Hello everybody, uh, welcome to the sixth session of the Exposure Studio. Exposure Studio is an online programme for Calgary based photographers realised and hosted by Exposure Photography Festival. The studio programme consists of a series of discussion based events led by speakers of international recognition in the worldwide photography scene. The programme promotes knowledge sharing and provides our local photographers with an opportunity to enhance their professional development. Please remember that this, recorded, this is a recorded event today, so if you wish to not be pre present within the recording, please hide your cameras now. This event will be structured as a screen shared presentation followed by a question and answer session. Questions can be asked by using the raise hand feature found in the participa participants icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We encourage you to ask questions verbally in order to provide a better interaction with the discussion. However, please note if this is something you are not comfortable with, um, we will also take questions from the chat box. So I'll now introduce you to Donna to present our land acknowledgement. Hi everyone, it's good to see you again. It's been so long. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to uh, do the territorial acknowledgement. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, the Pigani, the Kainai First Nations, the Tutina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. So welcome everyone, it's great to see you again. Uh, and I'm super delighted uh, that uh, my good friend Vince Chiani is here with us and Beth is going to introduce Vince and get us started. So I'd just like to thank uh, the Rosa Foundation and Calgary Arts Development for supporting the Exposure Studio with their online programming grant. Uh, so, so today's uh, speaker is Vincent Chiani, uh, joining us from Pennsylvania in Pittsburgh. Vincent is a documentary photographer and educator whose work focuses on social justice issues. His most celebrated works, Gaze in the Military and We Skate Hardcore, explore community of memory, the human condition and the use of image and text. Vincent's work has been exhibited internationally and his photographs are represented in numerous public and private collections. The Archive for Documentary Arts at Duke University established a study collection of his documentary projects in 2007. We Skate Hardcore was voted the best book design by American Association of University Presses. His work has also been reproduced in photo uh, journals and anthologies such as the New York Times, Huffington Post, Double Take, Photograph, Creative Camera, The Sun and The New Yorker. I will now hand you over to Vincent to deliver his presentation. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I am very honored to be here and want to personally thank uh, Beth and Donna uh, for inviting me to do, uh, to be one of the participants in this lecture series. I also want to thank the Exposure uh, Photo Festival as well as a whole and all of the people involved for doing such a great job bringing um, these kinds of series uh, to an online platform um, because of the uh, pandemic that we're experiencing right now. And I just wanna mention also that um, I think this convergence of the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter um, protests uh, that have been happening over the past few months have really brought to light personally many things that uh, that have, in my career, have brought me to this point uh, in terms of my photography and the community work that I do. Uh, so as you can see, the, uh, the name of this, uh, the lecture uh, is The Loss of Community, and I'll begin that in a few moments, but I just wanted to um, actually talk a little bit anecdotally um, about a couple experiences that occurred in my childhood that I think have had great impact uh, particularly during this time, um, you know, over the last you know four or five months of what we've been experiencing, and I think the primary thing that occurred was uh, I remember when I was probably uh, eight years old, um, John F. Kennedy was campaigning for president, and his motorcade came through 
my little town that I grew up in, in Old Forge, Pennsylvania. It's in the northeast part of Pennsylvania. It was a coal mining working class town. And I remember my dad picking me up and reaching me out and uh, I shook the hand of John F. Kennedy, not knowing who he was at the time. Uh, but because of that, I started to become interested in who this person was um, and what he was doing. And that was, I think, the beginning of my political engagement in a very naive way. But I started to follow many um, global things that occurred at the time, such as the, uh, the Berlin Wall uh, going up in 1962, um, the space program that occurred, and then of course the assassinations uh, that we all have become aware of. Uh, in addition to that, the civil rights movement and a lot of the cultural changes that occurred during the 1960s. So I think that was very formative for me um, in terms of my political engagement um, and my engagement with my own community. The second thing that happened was just maybe about a year later, and that was I became seriously ill and I was uh, quarantined basically, uh, bedridden in and out of hospitals for three years. Um, that really impacted my sense of uh, independence and I think curiosity. Uh, it also brought me a certain kind of internal strength because I was cut off from my family um, with very little interaction. Uh, I was homebound in terms of education. Uh, one of the things that I began to do, other than doing these very creative things like, you know, working with my hands, drawing and uh, even crocheting, uh, but also doing these little installations uh, in the basement of my home at, you know, a few years later. Uh, but the other thing that I used to do, uh, and I remember very clearly, is uh, read obituaries in newspapers. And I had a conversation just maybe about four or five days ago with someone I had just met. And we were talking about, you know, how people are connected with each other. And I think because I was going through this period of quarantine where I was cut off from the people that I loved, um, I wanted to actually understand and read about what others, what other people's sense of loss was. And I think that's why I read the obituary. So for me, it wasn't so much about the person who died, although I really, you know, empathized with that, but it was about what was left, you know, the loss that people felt after people died. Uh, and I think that's where my sense of empathy uh, grew. Um, and actually, it's, it's very much a part of the reason why I do the, the work that I do. Um, the other, the last thing is, I remember reading um, maybe in my early teens, a quote by um, by Mark Twain that went something like, um, the, ant the antidote for bigotry uh, and uh, discrimination is travel. Because once you travel and you begin to live with people that whose lives you don't know about, you begin to understand their rituals, you begin to understand the way that they think, their joys and their fears and their sorrows, their loss, uh, even their language and their culture. And this bigotry and hatred will soon diminish once you begin to relate and understand why people are like this. And that really impacted me as well. And again, it's kind of, you know, this, this subliminal thread that goes through a lot of what I do, why I do it, and the resulting work that occurs. So I'm gonna begin uh, with the lecture. Um, I will, I need to click on this file here. There we go. So 22 years ago on June 22nd, Kashia Thomas was 18 years old and a high school student when the KKK held a rally in her hometown of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Hundreds of protesters turned out to tell them they were not welcome in the progressive college town. At one point during the demonstration, a man with the Confederate flag, that person you see lying on the, on the ground, uh, with a Confederate flag t-shirt ended up on the protesters side and a small group of protesters chased him. He was knocked to the ground, kicked and hit with placard sticks, which you can see in the, in the photograph as well. As people shouted, kill the Nazi, 
because she had feared that mob mentality had taken over, threw herself on top of the man she had come to protest, protecting him and told the crowd that you cannot be goodness into a person. In discussing her motivation for this courageous act, she stated someone had to step out of the pack and say, this isn't right. I knew what it was like to be hurt. I wish someone would have stood up for me. Violence is violence. Nobody deserves to be hurt, especially not for an idea. Thomas never heard from the man, but months later, a young man came up to her to say thanks, telling her that the man she had protected was his father. For Thomas learning that he had a son brought even greater significance. People who hurt, quote, people who hurt come from hurt. Let's say that had killed him or hurt him really bad. How does the son feel? Does he carry on the violence? Mark Bruner, the student photographer who made this photograph, uh, added, she put herself at physical risk to protect someone who, in my opinion, would not have done the same for her. Kashia's choice was to affirm what they had lost. Kashia's choice was human. Kashia's choice was hope. And I think a lot of what is coming out in this photograph and the story behind it has a lot of resonance for what we are seeing on our streets today. The backbone of community is the individual, the family, and the group. Today, communities are continually becoming more homogenous, less diverse in most all demographics, more biased and prejudiced in making political, economic, and social choices, and extremely myopic in seeking resolutions to the devastating social, political, and economic problems that exist in the United States presently. Because of this lack of interaction and establishing relationships with people who are different from them, people are less willing to look for compromise. I graduated from Penn State University with a BS in community development and radical social politics. It was er the early 1970s. I had spent a year working as a community organizer. Almost 10 years later, I came to SUNY New Paltz this, by the way, is a photograph of a, a drop-in center that I began while I was working as a community organizer, uh, which was in my hometown. Um, almost 10 years later, I came to SUNY New Paltz, the State University of New York at New Paltz, to begin my Master of Fine Arts in Photography. In September 1983, in a documentary photography class, we were given an assignment to photograph a social justice project. So I initially went to Times Square in New York City to look at the underbelly of society. However, I felt I needed something that was more connected to my experience. I had been volunteering at a homeless shelter in Newburgh, New York, so I began photographing the residents who were also at the fringe of the community in a city that had decades-long history of major racial, social, political, and economic disparities. I investigated the lives of men who retained little or no control over their lives. As I made photographs of them, I would give them copies, which was a normal practice of documentary photographers, which they in turn would hang on their walls near their beds or in a common area. I investigated the lives of men who retained little, um, excuse me, um, However, given their transient lives, the photographs would be lost or folded up or possibly taken with them. There was no way to track what effect, if any, they had on them. I questioned how photography could impact their lives and, almost, uh, the, and the almost complete estrangement that they felt from the community. But I found very few answers, although I tried to preserve what little dignity they possessed in the photographs. Shortly after I graduated uh, from, with my master's degree in 1986, I moved to Poughkeepsie, New York with my partner, Scott. And the following year, he tested positive for HIV. The camera had become an integral part of my life, photographing everything as I struggled to find a way to navigate through a growing epidemic and make sense of what was happening. I began volunteering as a buddy to uh, people with AIDS who needed rides to doctor's appointments or to buy groceries or companionship to alleviate the absolute fear of imminent death uh, that came with a diagnosis. 
the personal became political. I joined ACT UP to demonstrate against the government's lack of support in the treatment and care of PWAs and the medical profession's slow development of research and testing drugs for a cure. Uh, this already sounds very similar to what we're going through today. Uh, Bill Arning writes in an essay titled, No Art Business as Usual in the catalog of the major exhibition, Art AIDS America. Quote, with the appearance of AIDS, diverse creative minds began recording, excuse me, responding forcefully to the crisis with all the ferocity and impetuousness characteristic of anyone who is actually dying or is trying to save the lives of loved ones. This took the form of subversion, metaphor, direct confrontation, camouflage, or quiet observation. These photographs were a diary of sorts, not meant to be seen or published, but to record what was happening in my life and in my community. My activism was loud. However, my photographs remained silent and hidden for many years until 2007 when I returned to them to rethink what had happened. Many friends had died. My partner Scott died in 1993. The, re the pictures now reside in LGBT archives as a part of the history of visualizing AIDS or in exhibitions that reflect on the visibility or lack thereof of a community that fought to the death for basic human rights. In, 19, in November 1989, I mentioned earlier that I was eight, nine years old when the Berlin Wall came, went up. Uh, in 1989, uh, almost uh, 30 years later, uh, the, Ber the Berlin Wall fell. And <clears throat> I was working at a small uh, college in New Hampshire, running the photo department there. And I was printing in my dark room when the news came on. And I decided I would leave my position as chair of the photography department and go to Berlin to witness what was to become a major historic domino effect breaking down what was seen as the impenetrable Iron Curtain. I was introduced to the squats in East Berlin where the political activity was concentrated by a friend, Stefan Matzig, then a university student who occupied a squat with other political activists. I had been obsessed with Berlin as a child when the wall was erected in 1961, along with the election of JFK and the first man on the moon. As a teenager in the 1960s, my politics were shaped by these events, as well as the cultural revolutions occurring at the time. It was one of the most tumultuous and divisive decades in world history, marked by the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War, and anti-war protests. Political assassinations, the women's and gay rights movements, and the emerging generation gap. I became immersed in Berlin in the demonstrations and battles waged by the police uh, against the Autonomen, an anarchist group that fought to push back against the right wing East German Nazi groups in the struggle to take control of the newly formed government in the first unified elections that were coming up in December 1990. The battle at Mainzerstrasse was the final battle where the movement was squelched their headquarters destroyed and cleared out, and their influence disappeared from the political stage. The left lost the battle for control. Unification had occurred only two months earlier. The Autonomen utilized English as a means to spread their message through the media, recognizing it as a universal language for communication and protest. Even though my attempt at becoming a full-time photo journalist was thwarted, although I did continue sending pictures to the pic picture agency Impact Visuals, I learned the power of image and text and the idea of universalizing struggle to reach a larger audience, extending community beyond the borders of the people engaged in the struggle themselves. Text was also central to my We Skate Hardcore project, a nine year documentary project made mostly in the seven square block area in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, where I lived for 15 years. My community was the South Side, a Puerto Rican and Dominican neighborhood that developed in the 1950s. I became as much a part of that community as I did with other communities that I identified with, not only in terms of photographing, but in terms of socializing, 
politics, relationships, and community work. I had moved to Brooklyn in 1992 to take a job as a director of a small gallery in Soho. In 1994, I began photographing at, in Williamsburg, and in 1995, I took a position at Parsons School of Design, where I still teach today. I also volunteered at a local organization in the South Side, teaching photography to former and recovering drug addicts. Collaboration became central to telling the story of the dreams and schemes of a bunch of scrappy inline skaters who built itinerant skate parks with discarded materials in illegal or abandoned areas until they were kicked out and moved to another place. At the same time, they were trying to get a skate park built by drawing up plans and advocating in the community, to the community board. My work with them helped in this effort, although it never came to fruition. Over the nine years, the photographs became more intimate and delved further into their lives as humans and young people coming of age in a rough neighborhood. The narrative wove photographs made by me and the skaters who wrote about their own lives on the photographs, as well as transcribed interviews and video stills into a story of hope and struggle to overcome the ec economics and bias that define their lives. Um, let me go back to here. Uh, I'm going to read this quote again, uh, the Mark Twain quote. Uh, he said, Tra travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. Nothing so liberalizes a man as travel and contact with many kinds of people. And as I mentioned before, what, try Mar what Mark Twain meant is that when we place ourselves in an environment we know little about, meet the people we never would have met before, learn about their culture, their language, their customs and rituals, experience their world, witness their joy and struggles, understand their needs, embrace their differences, and see them in as human, then fear and the unknown diminish and bigotry and discrimination fade away. So this is kind of interesting because it really relates to this work that I did in Williamsburg over nine years because I, I am not Puerto Rican, I am not Dominican, but I was part of a community that I really, um, uh, that I really loved uh, in, in terms of the, the culture, the food, uh, you know, the, the rituals, um, the energy, uh, the music, et cetera, et cetera. And I became part of uh, that culture by delving into the community and becoming part of that community on some level. At the same time, another community that I uh, identified with is the LGBTQ community. And this actually prompted, this connection with this community actually prompted this next major project that uh, Beth had mentioned earlier, uh, the Gays in the Military Project, which is a visual and audio investigation into the effects of the military's ban on the lives and careers of LGBTQ service members from World War II veterans veterans to recent enlistees and active duty personnel. The project combines photographs, text, and audio uh, recounting their experience of discrimination, harassment, and civil and human rights abuses. It seems I spent most of my life uninterested in knowing about the military because I, because I supported peace, the fight to end violence and injustice, and the sanctity of life. I couldn't understand why anyone would join the military, much less why gay people would join the military, an organization that shunned them. As a documentary photographer and a storyteller, I realized that no matter what my personal convictions, convictions and history were, the stories of LGBTQ service members and veterans were the experiences and history of people who were denied their civil rights, and in many cases were subjected to unjust treatment and human rights abuses. As part of this community that continues to struggle for equality, I cannot turn my back on their humanity. The photographs and audio testimonies have been used widely by organizations that were fighting to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell soon after President Obama took office. <clears throat> the
then in November, uh, 2009, I was working, um, excuse me, um, I lost my place here. Just give me a moment. Uh, I should say that this project started in November, 2009, when I was working in my studio in upstate New York, 60 miles north of New York City. I was listening to the local public radio station and the mother of a recently discharged 19 year old army private um, stationed in Afghanistan was being interviewed. When I heard Nathaniel Bowden's mother speak about him with the love, pride and confidence that she had, I thought of my own personal experiences having to hide my identity in the family, friends and colleagues and being the target of bigotry and hate crimes. In 2000, um, 2007, yes, in November 2007, I moved to uh, Newburgh, New York, which is 60 miles north of New York City. And about uh, five or six years later, I took a studio uh, in a renovated uh, manufacturing building that was turned into artist studios. And from the moment, uh, I, at, at that point, I began actually going out onto Liberty Street, which was a major street that runs north and south through the city of Newburgh, uh, through various neighborhoods. Uh, Liberty Street is a very important street because situated on one of the blocks on Liberty Street overlooking the Hudson River is Washington's headquarters. Uh, this headquarters was the place that the Revolutionary War was called to an end, the US Revolutionary War. At the time uh, before the war ended, it was called King's Highway in honor of the King of England, obviously. Uh, and once the war was won by Americans, uh, it was changed by George Washington to Liberty Street. And from the moment that I made my first photograph on Liberty Street, I wondered what I could bring to this conversation from which many residents who live there now felt they had been shut off for many years. Um, no answers came, but an openness to discussion flowed freely, so much that I knew that this would be a project that would develop over the years, as many of my projects do, based on making photographs on the street uh, before gaining their trust to make more intimate images of their lives. So for the past uh, five or six years, I have been photographing up and down Liberty Street, um, trying to get a sense or trying to represent a sense of who the people are that live there now. Uh, Newburgh has an amazing disparity uh, of economics as well as um, uh, social services that are offered to many people or access to, uh, you know, to good jobs, uh, to good housing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I began interviewing and actually recording uh, some of the people's stories. Uh, this is a work in progress, actually. Uh, some of the people's stories that I began photographing. Um, many of them were uh, involved in uh, alternative economies, uh, such as this young man uh, pictured here, um, was involved in uh, selling drugs. Um, and this young person, along with two other people, were arrested and uh, are presently in jail uh, for murdering um, an older man. Uh, many of the people, however, are really intent on uh, giving as much to their community as possible. This photographing and also uh, the elections of 2016 uh, brought me to a point where I, again, I began to wonder what I can give back to a community other than photographs uh, that would actually have a meaningful impact in their lives. Um, after the 2016 elections, I realized that grassroots organizing uh, and community initiatives uh, were really going to be very important in terms of offsetting the effects of what might occur during this present administration that we are in right now. So 
in talking with a number of people, um, hashing out some ideas, uh, I decided to open up what is now called the Newburgh Community Photo Project, or NCPP. It's a volunteer-run, grassroots, community-based photography educational program whose mission is to engage local youth on topics of local and national interest that relate directly to their lives and ultimately empower them to utilize photography and related media to advocate for change in their own lives and the lives of their communities. Uh, the project is, uh, as I mentioned, situated in the same uh, building that I have my studio in. Um, and this is the entrance into the building. And if you see the window on the right, that's the door and the entrance into the, uh, into the space itself. Uh, the first exhibition, or I should say the first workshop uh, that we actually uh, did was um, basically came about from me leafleting the neighborhood uh, with images of photojournalists and also documentary photographers um, asking the question, who is interested in um, learning about uh, photojournalism and documentary photography? There's an information meeting set on a certain date. There were eight people that showed up for that meeting, representing a really wide diversity of people in the neighborhood. Uh, from one person, Tylon Ross, who was on this invitation card, uh, whose sister was one of two girls who were murdered just about nine months before at a Halloween party that was taking place in Newburgh. Uh, Phoenix Gale, who you see here as well on the listed, uh, is a trans uh, black trans woman uh, who actually lost also a brother and a cousin from gun violence. And these eight people that came there came with stories um, that very similar stories that impacted their lives. Um, and I realized that at that point, uh, they were probably ranged between 30 years old and uh, late 40s or early 50s. Um, and I realized that, you know, this was an older group of people than we were attending on targeting, but they had the maturity to be able to take on this really major issue of gun violence in Newburgh. Newburgh was considered the highest, um, to have the highest rate of gun violence per capita in New York State. Uh, it was, it's devastatingly poor. Um, and there, in recently, in the last 10 years, they've seen a, an exponential increase of many immigrant populations, many of them undocumented. So you can understand what the issues uh, that are important to many of the residents of Newburgh and how these issues become uh, really kind of intertwined with their lives. Um, so the first, uh, the first project was called Last Seen or Seen, Stories of Loss and Remembrance. And basically uh, these eight people went out and photographed memorials uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, they photographed people who had lost loved ones uh, to gun violence, uh, brothers, sisters, parents, cousins, uncles, friends, et cetera, et cetera. And we put together an exhibition uh, of probably over a hundred photographs um, and invited, uh, certainly invited all of the people that were engaged in the project, that participated in the project, either being interviewed or being photographed, but a lot of community members and community organizations. And the opening of the exhibition brought in many people from the community who probably would never have entered into a building like this because this building it was being renovated and many of the studios, in, studios inside were being rented by newcomers to Newburgh who were moving out of say New York City or other areas to find much more affordable housing or studio space. So their, their kind of community was very cut off and separated from the residents uh, that had been living there in Newburgh for many, many years. So this was a way of extending a hand out to say, you know, come in and join us, come in and join uh, the, the, the uh, revitalization that's occurring, um, the new energy that's, that's coming into the community. And it was really met with 
powerful and uh, powerful feelings and emotions and open arms. The woman in the right, uh, on the right, uh, with the blue T-shirt, uh, with her daughter to her her, uh, her right or left, and the white uh, the white coat is the mother of uh, Omani Free, who was Tylan Ross's sister, who was murdered. So we still, she's still very much involved on many different levels, as is a couple other of the parents uh, who had lost children. So this was a way uh, that uh, that I thought I could put my skills. Um, in a, from a previous lifetime as a community organizer, uh, as an activist, and also as a photographer, as a documentary photographer, to actually reach out to the community and engage, uh, have the, the community members engage on issues that were rel relevant to them. Um, included in this exhibition, you see on the upper left-hand side of this photograph, uh, this is a picture of uh, Omani over here. And that's a picture of Tabitha. Those are the two friends that were that were murdered. Uh, and this is a map of the uh, downtown area of Newburgh. Uh, and we had, I'm not sure if you can see it from there, but we basically um, researched all of the murders that occurred and gun violence incidents that occurred the previous five years. And we pinned them in different areas. And you can see, uh, you might be able to see, but maybe not, that there are a concentration of pins in areas, which is the same concentration, basically, of intense poverty, high crime, and, um, and drug activity. So those two things obviously go hand in, with three or four things obviously go hand in hand. But mapping is a really interesting way to understand the dynamics of a community as well. We also engaged with a lot of community organizations where they came in uh, and actually had uh, uh, you know, workshops uh, or lectures uh, or seminars inside the space. This is a group of students from the local high school, Newburgh Free Academy. Uh, there were about 30 of them there. They were brought down by their uh, uh, three instructors <clears throat> and they engaged in conversation, many of them obviously. Uh, had friends uh, or relatives that, that died as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and I'm not sure if you can, this uh, little this little area over here on the right-hand side, uh, you can also see it in the next photograph on the left. But we would actually, this is the, uh, a binder that actually included a lot of the uh, newspaper stories of all of the gun violence incidents. And then they had a number that corresponded with the area on the map uh, where they occurred. But they, we also had these post-its where people could actually write their responses, their feelings, their emotions, or their memories, um, uh, and then post them on the wall or on this, uh, this freestanding pedestal over here. But eventually the entire wall just, get, just got filled with, uh, with post-its. You can see that, uh, that pedestal over here a little bit on the wall as well. So what we do, as I mentioned, at the Newburgh Community Photo Project, the following year, we were actually uh, uh, funded by a state organization that provided funds to, um, to provide education and other programming to people uh, living at or under the poverty line. So what we did was through an application and interview process, we accepted 10 participants uh, to the Newburgh Community Photo Project uh, for a project called Everyday Newburgh, uh, which is a continuing project every year that investigates different uh, social issues, um, such as uh, housing, water issues. We have just as bad a water uh, issue as Flint, Michigan does. Um, issues of gun violence, as I said, uh, issues of racism and discrimination, gentrification, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the kids come in, uh, they are given instruction on a wide variety of, uh, I'm not gonna go there yet. They're given instruction on a wide variety of uh, photographic uh, technical skills, uh, as well as composition and aesthetics. They're being taught uh, what a photo essay is, how to investigate stories, how to interview people, uh, transcribe, work with audio. Uh, so they're being taught a wide variety of skills. And then uh, ultimately what we come up with is 
an exhibition inside that space, which you see to the left of the kids walking down the street, as well as a public art uh, project as well. The first year, this group of kids, um, we actually had, took a building that was located just around the corner from our studio space. So here's the Newburgh Community Photo Project. This is the building, the side of the building. We use the front of it um, of facing out the Liberty Street to put up these banners, one image by each student uh, that we actually employed, um, that we actually have up there still now um, with an explanation of uh, what the project is and who the participants are. Um, and then these are some hashtag everyday Newberg. This is where we live. They're community narratives by citizen journalists. Those are the people and then it gives some information on us. But these are some of the individual pieces uh, that were employed there. Uh, Stephen Flores was the person who was working on housing issues. Uh, and David Cordero was working on ideas and issues of gentrification. So this is the last slide. What I'm going to uh, just say now, I'm gonna bring you up to date and then we can open it up to a conversation. Um, what had uh, the following year, last year, 2019, we began getting uh, a grant from a major foundation uh, and we do uh, an annual benefit to raise money. And we also, um, we also uh, uh, asked for sponsorships uh, many different levels. So through those three variety of uh, funding sources, uh, we raise enough money to actually uh, run the workshops during the summer. And probably a good 25 to 30% of that, uh, that funding goes back to the community in one way or another. Specifically, and most importantly, uh, is that we actually pay the participants to uh, participate in the workshops. So if they successfully complete the program um, and are involved in the exhibition and the public art project, then they receive a stipend at the end of the, uh, of the workshop. Uh, during a, a major opening that occurs during uh, an annual Newburgh Open Studios where over 120 artists and, and artist collectives open up their studios for people to come visit and we're part of that. The following year, uh, as I mentioned, when we got the grant, uh, was our second year as the uh, Newburgh Community Photo Project, Everyday, uh, uh, Everyday Newburgh. And again, through application and uh, interview process, we selected a number, uh, a num 10 other people. That group of people worked on a wide variety of different, uh, different uh, projects and issues. And for this, for last year's, instead of putting up banners, we decided to keep up the banners. And instead we made these uh, public service announcements that ranged from around uh, 14 by 17 inches up to about three feet by five feet. And we plastered them all over the city uh, in delis and in uh, supermarkets, uh, in bodegas, uh, in government buildings, in public service buildings, et cetera, et cetera, in windows of hardware stores, everything that was, it, it, they were all concentrated downtown. But these public service announcements were printed in English and Spanish uh, because a lot of the issues, one of the major issues that they worked on was immigration. Um, and that, as I mentioned before, is, is, a, is a very important issue since over 50% of the population is now an immigrant population. Um, so what happened uh, with this year we were going along already to do another series of workshops and then COVID hit and it changed everything. And for months, um, I actually, interestingly enough, quarantined myself in the dark room for about three months uh, and did a lot of printing of images of uh, gay pride marches that I photographed between 1985 and 1995. But then when I kind of emerged from the dark room, I started thinking, what are we going to do with the Newburgh Community Photo Project? We cannot deliver the same kinds of workshops because of social distancing and health regulations. So I came up with the idea, um, as I mentioned, I, I teach at Parsons School of Design and the, the last semester, the, the spring semester of Parsons, uh, we did a collaborative project 
with JR's school over in France, um, where we sent images back and forth between students, my students and, and their students. Uh, and because I established that relationship with them, and I know JR's work very well, um, I decided that we would actually do a project where we could utilize his Inside Out project. Uh, I don't know if any of you know about this, but this is the, a global project where they print images that are made by community groups, single individuals, you know, large groups of people about issues that they want to commemorate. And you send them the, the pictures, the files, and they print them for you and send them back, and then you we paste them all over. So this year we're working with only five participants. They were handpicked from the previous two workshops. Uh, so they, we didn't have to deliver any kind of technical um, uh, instruction or instruction about photojournalism or interviewing, et cetera, et cetera. They were all very, they were all already skilled in those areas. Uh, and they are now in the midst of working on a collaborative project on uh, COVID and Black Lives Matter. So what we are doing, I'll just explain them very briefly, then we can go to questions. What we are doing is we are photographing uh, up to about 300 people uh, with a black mask, three different kinds. One says COVID safe, one says hashtag BLM, and the other one says I can't breathe. And we're photographing people in the community who are most affected by these issues. Obviously black and brown communities primarily. Um, and the kids themselves, the five kids are kind of shaping and refining and defining the project um, through discussions and, um, uh, and uh, presentation, not presentation, through discussions that we have uh, for the first few weeks. And now they're in the midst of actually photographing the people. So we're, they're also doing all the, um, um, all of the interfacing with city government for use of city government buildings or public spaces. They're contacting businesses or building owners uh, to utilize uh, different buildings in the community. Uh, they're planning the installation. They're working on our social media. So they're engaged on another level of, um, of interaction and, uh, and engagement with photography and community activism. So that's where we are right now. And I will now defer to, um, to Beth or to Donna, actually. So of course, this is the moment that my dog starts barking. So you'll hear some barking in the background. Um, but uh, Louis has very patiently been waiting to ask a question uh, for, for quite some time. So Louis, why don't you lead us off and um, um, then I'm going to keep my eye on the hands raised. I see David uh, is next and uh, we'll go from there. So Louis, go ahead. Um, hi. Yeah. No, thanks, Vincent, for taking the time to share your work and your activism. Um, it's social documentary photography has definitely been something I've always admired. Um, you mentioned that near the start of your presentation um, at times at the beginning, I don't know now, but uh, mentioning how much photography can do to really make the world a better place. Like, what do you think of, I don't know, photography for t photography's sake? Like, how does it fit into the climate of activist and protest photography? Like, is it bourgeois? Like, what's a healthy way to square, like, the seemingly selfish act of art making with things like crisis and, and what, it, what, what you care about? Uh, that's a very good question. It's also very layered. I might spend the next half hour answering it, uh, but I'll try to be brief. Uh, I think innately photography has this ability uh, to relay information uh, and relay um, ideas. Um, this is why photography was invented in a sense um, to actually document things. And when you think of the word documentary, it comes from the Greek word, uh, excuse me, the Latin word docere, which means to teach. So ultimately, when you think of documentary photography, it's really uh, not, an, it's not an art practice. I mean, if you, 
you, you cannot think of doc, doing documentary work or doing the kind of work that I do in social justice uh, with the same as being a fine artist or an art photographer, because they're two very different things. Being a documentary photographer or photojournalist, you're really engaged in the world and you're engaged with issues. And the importance are the issues and the people that are affected by these issues. Of course, you want to be an excellent photographer, a skilled photographer, understand how an image can communicate ideas very succinctly and very, very poignantly in order to be able to utilize that medium uh, to engage uh, and expand the understanding of whatever issue that you're involved in. So I think photography, if we look around us, <clears throat> we are an image culture. There is nothing that we can, that we understand that has not connected with some kind of image or image making. You know, even our day-to-day -day relationships are built on images through social media rather than in person. Uh, you know, there, we have more and more understanding of other people through images. And then you start thinking of, you know, um, I mean, I could, I could go on and on about that, but you know, essentially photography has this ability to communicate clearly ideas. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that in our time uh, with what's happening, uh, even when you look at Black Lives Matter and the protests that have uh, emerged because of uh, the killing of, um, uh, of um, George Floyd and Am um, Ahmaud Arbery, uh, and uh, um, oh, what's her name out in uh, Minneapolis? I'm spacing on her name, I'm sorry. Um, you know, the three- George Floyd in Minneapolis and Breonna Taylor? Is Breonna Taylor, you? excuse me. Yeah, Breonna Taylor. George Floyd is in Minneapolis. Um, you know, with, with the, you know, one of the reasons why these, uh, these murders and these protests have come uh, and spread so widely is because of cell phone technology and video and image making. So if you think about only that, the impact that the photograph or the image, uh, whether it's a still photograph or a moving image, has major social effects and major cultural impact. So Vince, I'm just going to push you on your your response a little bit, if if that's okay. Um, sure. uh, I mean, clearly, um, well, to me, clearly, uh, the most powerful documentary photographs, uh, in many ways, sort of employ the most sublime artistry. That is, you know, there's there's a kind of knowledge about how to make a photograph that will do the work that uh, the photographer wants it to do. So there's, there's that uh, point. I once had a photojournalism student many years ago. He was a very funny young man. And he said, uh, pictures made by photojournalists have to be boring. And I said, why would you wanna make boring pictures? And he said, because they have to be neutral. They have to be unbiased. And so they have to be boring. And I said, well, even boring has an aesthetic to it. And, you know, I have this tussle with this guy, but there's, you know, the, the, the artistry, the aesthetics of documentary, uh, you know, are something that I know you are engaged with because I know your work. And in addition to that, I think, um, I'm going to just ask you, do you take pleasure in making what you consider to be a successful picture from a visual standpoint, not necessarily from sort of a pragmatic uh, instrumental standpoint? Um, yes, I actually totally agree with you, that statement that you made. Um, I think documentary photography um, and socially engaged photography uh, has to be made so that the visuals and the aesthetics um, are such that people will be engaged in looking at them. And I think the artistry, as you said, uh, is just as important in documentary photography and photojournalism. Uh, and by artistry, I mean that the photographer understands how to take a photograph of a scene and make it into a successful photograph, how to organize the space, what to include or exclude, how to relate foreground with background, subject to subject. 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the, the point that I was making before is that you don't think of yourself as an art photographer. You think of yourself as something other than that. You know, a photographer who's engaged in, in social justice. Um, so I think that meant, you know, that, that that's what I was referring to when I said, when I made that distinction. And actually somebody, um, somebody asked me, when did you consider yourself a photographer? And I remember that I never used to call myself a photographer. I always used to say I take pictures. Um, up until, um, I think it was up until uh, I actually began doing documentary work and realized that it was such a part of my life and who I am uh, and my, you know, my interests, my engagement in the world, et cetera, et cetera. And that's when I felt as though I was a photographer, when it really kind of merged with my life. Uh, but you also uh, mentioned something that I wanted to uh, point out, and that is um, a photograph should not be boring. Uh, even a documentary photographer, photor a photograph or a photojournalist. But when you think, you know, you think that there are different classifications of ph photography as, um, as is outlined by a number of different uh, theorists. Uh, including A.D. Coleman. And at the very bottom, you know, you have photographs that function very well as description, you know, like our IDs uh, or explaining something like medical photographs. Uh, but then you get to the, uh, you know, aesthetically uh, or the culturally engaged photographs, which you have to know the tools to be able to create successful uh, 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 descriptive photographs and explanatory photographs but then you elevate them so that they become part of an aesthetic that connects with the issues that you're photographing. So yeah, I think there's, you know, there are these different levels and you know, what your photojournalism student may have been uh, referring to is that a lot of photographs that are in newspapers, you know, uh, spot news, not, uh, well, not necessarily, but general news photographs like, you know, campaign rallies or, you know, meetings or something like that. They're not the most interesting. They're just, you know, documenting and describing what occurred there. But it's those photographs that are made uh, as, as more like spot news uh, or to, to engage people more on a subject that are really uh, the most engaging ones in a sense. However, I also think that if you begin to put too much, um, uh, too much emphasis on the aesthetics of the photograph, you get lost and you get disconnected from the actual issues that you're doing. So there has to be a balance, you know, and, and how do you come, to, you know, do you make, I get, I personally, I get very excited when I see images that are just beautiful, that just work, um, that just, you know, speak to me or it can speak to other people without having to say a word. Yes, I do get very excited, but that does not take precedence. Okay. Thank you. Uh, David uh, is up next. David Christensen. All right, thanks, Donna. Hi, Vincent. Um, thanks for the uh, fascinating talk. Um, I've got a, I'm, I'm, I mean, the, 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 New, the, the Newburgh Community Photo Project is fascinating on a whole bunch of levels. And I was curious about, um, uh, and this is going to sound, um, uh, I hope this is kind of more nuanced than it's sort of coming out, but how do you, how do you measure success with the work that's going on there? Do you have to in some way to, you know, the community or to, you know, organizations that are going to fund it? And if so, how do you do that with the kind of work that's going on there? Um, we measure success by actually gauging how involved the rest of the community is with the Newburgh Community Photo Project. So let me kind of expand on that idea. Number one, uh, from the couple previous workshops, uh, we've only been in existence for three years. And I said, well, actually, this is our fourth workshop. The first workshop, they were, they were actually grown individuals. Um, and many were involved in similar kinds of uh, work. Um, you know, one was a teacher at high school, one was involved with uh, a poverty program, uh, one was a, a street person, basically, you know, 
you know, basically he was a street person that was really interested in learning photography. So it was a wide range. Uh, but the, the, the younger kids that we're now focusing and, and targeting, uh, they range in age between 16 and 24. So one of the, one of the things that we gauge on our success is that there's usually one or two people that are taking the workshop because they're interested. You know, they might be in high school, but it kind of solidifies their interest in pursuing some kind of media work. So that's one way of gauging its success and that we're actually touching people's lives. Another way is, the, uh, is how many organizations continually actually contact us uh, to ask us if we can be involved in certain projects. So for example, uh, last year, uh, Newburgh is celebrating the 150th anniversary of Frederick Douglass coming to Newburgh uh, to give a lecture on voting rights. And of course, we all know that the, it's the 150th anniversary of the amendment that, allowed, that gave black men uh, the right to vote. It was you know, 50 years later that women were given the right to vote, all women were given the right to vote. So you know, 1920 and 1870 were, were very important years um, in, in terms of that. So this organization, this community collective, I should say, uh, that wanted to do a series of programs to commemorate the, uh, uh, this lecture uh, and this speech given by Frederick Douglass in Newburgh, uh, started organizing a series of barbershop talks. And then we actually started working with them to actually go around to interview and photograph the barbershops. The kids who worked in the previous workshop were employed. And whatever we involved the kids for whatever organization, uh, any organization's needs, NCPP does it free or gratis, uh, but the kids always get a stipend. So they were engaged in, in actually photographing and, and working on another project. Um, two of them that worked on that are now taking this project here. But I think that the constant, um, um, I mean, we can even gauge it by social media. You know, a lot of people in the community and beyond actually, you know, engage with us on social media, either Instagram uh, or Facebook, mostly Instagram actually. Um, but we always, we're always getting uh, requests by people in the community to have us become involved in some of their projects that they're doing. So I think that's the major thing that we, get, we use to gauge the success of it. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, yeah, Ashley, you. Oh, David, are you, did you wanna follow up? You're good? No, I just said thanks very much. Okay. Thank you for the question. Okay, Ashley. Uh, thanks very much, Vincent. And I might break up as I come through this because I've had a lot of problems uh, hearing you tonight, but uh, I hope it's reasonably clear to you right now. Um, Vincent, I was, thank you first of all for your, your presentation, fascinating stuff. Um, I was interested in your briefing that we were all supplied with. And, and one of the things that you expressed was your use of, your interest in the use of image and text. Um, I, I'm, I'm a documentary photographer, but I also love to write. I have to write, I must write, as well as take my... Uh, and, and not least because there, there are many... Oh, and by the way, I, I do work in Latin American communities as well. So I, I'm fascinated about this, this combination of, of using Spanish, in this case, Spanish and English, uh, alongside these photographs. And, and particularly when there are very nuanced themes. Um, uh, one, that, one that comes to mind is what community I worked in, uh, a lot of anemia in children. Uh, and how do you photograph anemia? It's incredibly difficult to photograph anemia. You have to represent it, you have to do it indirectly. And, and along the way, I, I, at the moment and for a long time, I felt I have to also express that by using words alongside the images. Now, when you're working in two languages, the, the situation becomes rather cluttered because you've got the photographs, you've got a sequence of photographs, you've got an English text, you've got a, a Spanish text. And some people don't like photo books having text. I personally do. Um, and, and it is a matter of opinion. So where I'm going to on the question is, I'm really interested in, in how your approach has evolved, 
how you bring together words and images in a more forceful way that perhaps to, to Lewis point, you know, affects change or, or inspires further thinking and so on. And so how do you get that balance between the words and images? How do you integrate them? How do you do it in such a way that it doesn't, one thing doesn't clutter another? Right. Very good question. And I think it's also speaks to part of what I'm supposed to talk about in this lecture presentation, and that is editing for photo books. So I will use those examples to answer your question, uh, but I'm going to preface it with one of the photographs that, or a couple of the photographs that I showed in the presentation were from uh, East Berlin uh, and the battle at Meisterstrasse, and I was talking about how English was used by the Autonomen because that was a universal language and it got the message out. So initially my response is that the photograph is a language. Photography has its own language. It's able to communicate on a very universal way through image. Um, and we, even though most of the people, 90% of the people don't really realize it or recognize it, but we have become very uh, skilled at reading photographs um, and responding to them and, and, and all that. Uh, I think text comes in uh, where, you know, you gave a very good example in terms of how do you photograph autism? And I think I can parallel that with the project Gaze in the Military. Um, how do you photograph the, uh, you know, the, the, the horrible uh, discrimination and the horrible uh, violence that they, that many of them uh, experienced while they were in the military, uh, much less being discharged and losing all their benefits, et cetera, et cetera. How do you photograph that? You cannot photograph that. You cannot photograph something that occurred, you know, 10, 15, you cannot photograph something that occurred 10 seconds ago, okay? Uh, the photograph really is photographing you know, what's happening and what's, what's happening in front of the camera. Um, so in instances like that, where people's life stories are really important, and I can only relate this to, you know, how I use text. Text is so important to illuminate an understanding of how you view that particular individual, for example. Uh, and again, I'm going to go back to using the gaze in the military. The book was put together uh, as a series of portraits uh, so that we could actually consider the individuals having some context in terms of knowing what this, these individuals, why these individuals are appearing in this, uh, this group of, of photographs in this book by introducing it with some background, historical background, uh, you know, uh, some text on it or some essay on the issue itself. Uh, so you go into looking at the images of people and their life or uh, people and who they are just by looking at them, what they're wearing, the surroundings, whether it's, uh, you know, inside of their home or in a, very, a place that means something very special to them. Or for example, in one of the images that I showed, a woman sitting in her uh, couch in her bedroom holding a gun. Um, and it says something about this person. Um, however, sometimes I find that you need to expand upon um, what is being shown in that photograph that cannot be shown because it, can't, it has not ha occurred in front of your lens. So that is where the interviewing and the text, the transcribed text of these individuals um, help support the understanding of the photograph. However, if I'm gonna talk a little bit about structuring a book and editing for a book, this book was very different than the uh, previous book, We Skate Hardcore, in that there were a series of portraits and you were able to look at them as portraits, as photographic images, with an understanding of why they are in that book. But you, until you get to the end, you don't understand, you don't realize their full story. And their full story is for each individual portrait is transcribed and uh, written. You bring up a very good point that a lot of people don't want to take the time to read. Um, so the book was designed and put together such that in the beginning, as I mentioned, there were three very brief essays. 
um, establishing the, the context of the photographs um, and the, the history of the gay ban, as well as a personal story by one of the one of the people that I photographed. So you have enough information there then to understand, you know, what possibilities may have occurred in these people's lives, what experiences they may have uh, occurred. But it, you don't get until the end. It's not until the end that you really get the exact story about each individual's lives. And the way that the book was put together is that uh, when you read the interviews, first of all, the paper changed from a, a, a coded high gloss paper where the portraits are because the portraits were, uh, the person who did the scans with the portraits was such a master and these portraits were stunning, like they just popped off the page. Uh, but then when you get to the back to the in transcribed interviews, the paper changes to newsprint. And it, you know, the, the, the font that's used is very reminiscent of official documents or government documents. So you get this understanding through how the text looks and how the text reads and the kind of paper it's, it's being read on, uh, that it is evidence or proof in a sense. At the end of that transcribed interview for each person is a page number where it refers back to the image and you could go back and reconsider that image. So that whole idea of moving back and forth in the book is established. As opposed to We Skate Hardcore. We Skate Hardcore is a linear narrative and as I had mentioned, maybe not clearly enough, but We Skate Hardcore is every single page is different in terms of layout. Sometimes there's, you know, 20 pictures on the page. Sometimes there's one. Sometimes there's writing. Sometimes the paper changes as well. Because I utilized photographs, video, <clears throat> transcribed, uh, uh, transcribed interviews, uh, photographs written uh, on by the kids. That I, that I made pictures of, and also photographs that they made. So this is a montage of images that were put together in a very different way to actually build a narrative, uh, a linear narrative throughout the book to tell the story of what their experience was. So I had to consider the use of the text and, and the image in extremely different ways for those two projects. And I think when I started eat both projects, I never thought about making a book. That was all that always that always came much later. I don't I don't necessarily think about making books when I begin projects because I'm more engaged in the issues than I am and what the outcome of these photographs might be. <clears throat> but when I got to that point of having to think about it, it was they were very different processes. And I think you have to understand the work and the material that you have before you actually make, you know, are able to make that step into putting into this kind of organized uh, visual package. Does that answer a question? The yeah, uh, it's, it's very helpful. Yeah, I appreciate that. If, if I could just very briefly add, add to that, that and, and, and really, I'd, I'd love to get you know, on the chat line or wherever, other people's opinions about this because it fascinates me a lot. Uh, and I would like to hear other people, but if I can use a sports analogy, um, uh, putting a book like this together, it's, it's like um, if it's a game of football, do, uh, are, are the words uh, the referee or are the words a player? And the extent to which they come into the use of the images, because I, I want to put out photo books but I cannot let go of the words. And so that, that, as I say, you know, should the words be a referee or should the words be a player? In other words, the extent to which they are engaging that readership. Right. So um, I, I think, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I don't want to use that, that same analogy uh, that you're using because I'm not sure how you think of referee or how you think of a player. And I think you could actually talk about them in slightly different ways. But what I will say is that that whole idea of how words function uh, was the utmost, uh, one of the utmost issues that I had to deal with and understand. So in Woodskate Hardcore, the words came in uh, when they needed to illuminate very specific facts and very specific movement of the narrative. 
um, where the photographs were not, maybe were not able to do that. But the major storyline and the major experience had to be from the photographs. So in a sense, uh, I'll use like a, a supporting actor and the main actor rather than a referee and, uh, and a player. So in a sense, the words were supporting actors uh, or even a chorus if you wanted to, you know, like an old Greek chorus that gave you context of what was happening specifically in the play. Um, and, but the photographs are the players in that sense. So maybe, you know, you could use the same analogy. Very differently in in uh, case in the military, um, the words acted as their own main player. Um, and I don't know if you noticed uh, the way that I made my presentation, uh, the way that I, you know, I, I, I was reading information and in the lecture at the same time showing images. So in a sense, there were two parallel narratives that were taking place there. And I really liked leaving it up to the viewer to be able to put those narratives together and relate them together. So that's why I decided to separate the text from the images in the gaze in the military, because I wanted that narrative of just looking at photographs, looking at portraits, looking at people uh, and connecting with them on a very human level um, and bringing our own prejudices and biases to how we view these people, as opposed to really uh, really knowing about what their story is. So the, the, the text really exists independently of the images. But as I said, you can go back and forth between them because you have that page number. So they function in two different ways, two extremely different ways. And I think it's really, I can't say what is the best way to, uh, you know, to work with the text and should it act as a referee or a player. I think that is very dependent on the images you have, the, the project that it is that you're working on, and how you envision the narrative to come through, whether it's a open-ended, non-linear narrative or a linear narrative. So all of those considerations need to be taken into account before you actually understand how the text will expand on the understanding of the images. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, so we have Emma and then Rocio. Okay, Emma. Hi, sorry, just finding the unmute button. Um, I've been scribbling notes and I'm not sure I got um, noted your phrasing exactly, but early on you said something about uh, expanding the borders of the communities that you photograph, um, that you're turning something really specific into something universal um, and that through your photography you're essentially like inviting the rest of the world into that community um, or maybe more so in the case of the Newburgh community project like giving that community back to itself um, and I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit more about like what happens when those world worlds collide like when the outside meets that um, very specific community or when Newburgh meets that reflection of itself um, like how involved are you at that point? Uh, or is your work sort of finished before that collision occurs? Hmm. Uh, can you explain a little more what you mean by the collision? Um, I guess like, I'm curious about, um, I get part of that uh, sort of the, the viewer, the audience meeting the subject. Um, what happens then would be um, like the subjects feelings about the way that they are perceived or um, okay. things in that vein. So you're talking, uh, you're talking very specifically about, um, about, not only about, the, about the subjects themselves, uh, about my relationship to the subjects or the photographs of the subjects, as well as an audience's uh, reaction to the photographs and to the subjects ultimately. Mm -hmm. Those are, you know, so let me put in the context of this. Um, there is, uh, and if you want to look into it, uh, Pablo Helguera uh, writes very extensively about socially engaged art. And socially engaged art is art that actually engages um, not only a viewer and uh, a photographer or a viewer and a photograph, 
but engages a community, engages the subjects, and engages the photographer uh, collab collectively and collaboratively. So this is ultimately what I have worked towards uh, in the projects that I've done over the years, because in every single aspect of the project, of the projects that I've done, I was engaged on some level in the community. And the people, uh, you know, it's not only making photographs and using the photographs without the people understanding. For example, when I did Rescape Art Core, uh, I would utilize a lot of those pictures in a picture agency, uh, but I only selected those images that would not have been misrepresented by use of the photographs for in other contexts. But at the same time, I actually went out and got a release because I never got, got releases when I was doing documentary work. It wasn't necessary. Uh, but when I was putting them in a the picture agency and there was this uh, possibility of them being used, say, in a commercial or for commercial purposes um, and getting paid for it, then I needed a model release. So when, when I went back to get model releases of the particular subjects whose photographs I was using, I wrote in a, a, a clause in there that they would get a certain percentage of whatever money that was made with the photographs. So I think the way that I uh, engage, um, I try not, I try for it not to be a collision, although collisions do occur, but I, I try uh, to engage and continually engage with my subjects even after the projects have ended, because I don't look at it as a project. I look at it as an extension of my personal life and my experiences. Um, so again, for example, I'm still very, very close with about five or six people from We Skate Hardcore, where, I mean, I've been to their weddings, I've seen their kids grow. Uh, we get together every couple of years, um, but I'm also engaged with a lot of the rest of them through social media. Uh, so we still have this ongoing friendship, if you will, um, and an ongoing respect for each other in terms of who we are and what we do. Um, with gays in the military, it's the same thing. You know, I, I constantly uh, talk with people on social media, but also meet up with them. So I don't know how it is for other photographers, but um, I don't produce a hell of a lot of work. And I think it's because part of it is these, you know, the work that I do produce is part of me uh, establishing and nurturing and engaging in relationships with the people that I do photograph. Now, there's another side to that. That's my own personal experience. When those photographs are put out to the world, in a sense, you almost cannot control what they do. And whatever, uh, I will not put out photographs that will um, reflect untruthfully uh, upon any uh, anybody that I photograph. Um, and in some respects, as I mentioned before, there's a particular photograph from We Skate Hardcore where uh, it's a photograph of Anthony uh, hitting on this girl that he had been wanting to get a date with. Uh, and there's uh, her friend in the background uh, with a baby carriage with the baby's arm sticking out. And it doesn't define who the child, who that baby belongs to. So that photograph can be interpreted and contextualized in very different ways. And I actually use that photograph with some of my students when we're learning about looking at photographs and talking about photographs and interpreting photographs. So because that was open for interpretation, I did not choose that photograph to put into a stock agency. Even though the stock agency really wanted that photograph, I wouldn't let it, I wouldn't let it go. So I maintained some control in a sense over the possibility of my images being recontextualized for something other than the, what they were uh, originally shot for. Um, I have, uh, I, I think with all the projects that I've done, all the people that I photographed, except maybe possibly for the more street work that I did, like with the homeless men's shelter or down in New York City um, or over in Berlin, I don't, I, 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 I was more of a journalist, photojournalist at that point and with that kind of perspective. So I think with We Skate Hardcore, Gays in the Military, and now the Newburgh Community Photo Project and the, and the photographs I'm making at Newburgh, it's on a very different level. So I'm engaged with people on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but thank you. And I guess there's one quick follow-up. Um, like, would you put Old Forge in that same 
category? Like I was really curious about that as a place that you like was obviously very intimate to you. You'd grown up there, but then left and then coming back to it so much later, um, like how that relationship was and played that's out. A, that's a really good, that's a really good example to bring up. Uh, Old Forge, the Old Forge uh, photographs were made at a time when my mom was going through uh, uh, chemo for cancer. She was, you know, for a period of about three years. Uh, you know, she was ill and I was having to go back a lot. And of course, you know, any photographer will find a way to, uh, uh, you know, to employ the work. I, I mean, I know there's a, if you want to take a look at a really great project, uh, Maggie Steber uh, photographed her mother as she, when she was dying, through the process of dying. Her mother was 93, 95 years old. Maggie Steber had photographed Che Guevara, Fidel Castro. She was very much a, uh, you know, one of the major photojournalists in the 60s, 70s, and, and 80s. Um, but it's such a sensitive uh, project that she did. And also Phil Toledano uh, photographed uh, and, and made a multimedia presentation about uh, his father dying, okay? Um, I came back to a per and, and I have to be real honest, one of the things that my mom said to me before she died a few years ago, um, and I think this really kind of embodied and made me understand that she really understood what I did, what I was doing in my life. She said, you know, for, she said, you've always been a troublemaker since you were a kid, but you made a career out of it. And I was like, okay, fine. That's like what the last thing she said to me. And that was one of the most powerful things she could have said. At the time when I was going back to see my mom, which was maybe about 10 or 12 years ago, uh, because she did survive that cancer, um, she would not have been comfortable being photographed by me constantly. You know, I, I, there wasn't that relationship uh, that I was able to, to do that. So I had to actually uh, connect in some other way um, and look, going back and photographing old forge, you'll notice it's also in color. You know, most of my work is in black and white, uh, but this was in color. Um, it was it was going back to a place where I just did not feel real connected to. The only connection I had to my hometown was the graveyard where my father and my ancestors were buried, and my mom and some you know maybe some cousins, and of course the pizza places that were there because it's like some of the best pizza. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, in a, in a way it's much, that project is even much more distanced, emotionally distanced. Uh, and I think you could tell from the photographs. So it's more observation from an outside perspective rather than observation as a participant. So just to explain my uh, spastic looking clapping when um, Vince mentioned Anthony hitting on Giselle, um, as I used to use that photograph in a course that I taught uh, as an exercise on how to read and interpret a photograph. And it led to a whole lot of different stories that students drew from it. And at one point, I contacted Vince to get the lowdown. What's really happening here? So that we could settle on what the true activity was, but even so the multi-meaningfulness, the polysemy of the photograph was pretty amazing. So uh, Louis put a link to it. Hmm? Did I give you the answer? Because a lot of times- Oh I yeah, you did. You did, I have it somewhere. A lot of people, um, a lot of times tell people it doesn't matter. It's really how you interpret it. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's, it's such a great photograph uh, for that purpose because it could be so many things going on. Um, and then it opens up conversations and absolutely. it really kind of illuminates people's perspectives and maybe even their own experiences. Yeah. So Rocio is waiting patiently. And so let's go to Rocio. I don't know if you guys can hear me. My phone is doing these funny things. I am I do you very well, Rocio. Oh, okay. Hold on. Um, <laughs> so I'm really enjoying this uh, this conversation, and I don't know if I'm actually be able to explain what I what I mean here, but I'll try. Um, 
it seems to me that a lot of the curatorial choices that they're made in a lot of institutions, especially when I, you know, I go into push is work that um, is made by people who have been trained, you know, like people who went to art school and things like that. And, um, you know, when you're working with community projects, a lot of these people that are creating this work, they are not trained in, in an art school. And um, I guess my question is, like, what are your thoughts, um, you know, on regards to that? Because it feels to me that any artist who works with community projects, I, I do community projects, and somehow they work that my community is making is almost considered like if it was like social work. Um, so uh, I, I wrestle with that because I feel like it sometimes is very um, exclusionary, um, but it's just my, my internal wrestling, but I wanted to hear what you had to say about that. Uh, again, uh, you all are asking questions that we could probably have a three hour discussion for each question uh, because they're so, they're so layered um, and, and complex in a way. But thank you very much for that question. I, I did, act, you, got, you got cut off in the very beginning, uh, but I'm assuming that you were saying that a lot of times when you enter institutions, you don't see this kind of work by, uh, by people who are not trained um, as, you know, as artists. So that's a very good statement. I, I, I probably, uh, I will answer it in a couple different ways. Number one, in terms of the community work and the people that are engaged uh, in, the, uh, in the community work, I think the ultimate reason for doing this is to actually engage people in their community. So when you think about what is the purpose of making this work, if the purpose is just to have an exhibition, to show your work, to stand up in front of a crowd and say that these are my pictures, you know, it, it kind of falls flat. That's mm -hmm. not uh, socially engaged in community work is really about building a community and uh, and having this work as a, as a very important element in communicating ideas within that community, uh, uh, processes or goals or dreams or whatever it is. Um, I had mentioned that my undergraduate, undergraduate degree is not in photography, it's not in art, uh, it's in community uh, organizing and radical social politics. I went to graduate school for photography, but you know, it, it wasn't, uh, I actually selected my graduate school because it was a good climbing area and there was a lot of good hiking around there. Um, but throughout my entire career, I, I, I had, I've had exhibitions, uh, mostly in institutions, um, whether it's university uh, galleries or museums uh, or other museums. Um, but I've never really pursued being an exhibiting artist ever in my life because that was not my interest. That's not, I knew that that's not where my photographs would reside and have the most impact. Rather, what I did was I nurtured relationships uh, with curators uh, or archivists, uh, curators at, at uh, museums or archivists at libraries uh, or um, you know, other, other kinds of institutions where my photographs were collected as documents, historical documents, as, as if you will. So uh, Beth had mentioned that the Archive for Documentary Arts at Duke University collects all of my, uh, all of my work. So all the projects that I've worked on are reside there. But the use of them extends beyond you know, their, their files, you know, the other departments at the university use them, researchers come and use this, uh, I mean, not specifically my, my class, but uh, they use the uh, archive for documentary arts for research purposes and within, from very different fields, you know, uh, it, it really varies widely. I remember I had a, a, a um, it was a Skype call at the time, this was maybe about eight years ago, uh, I had a Skype call with uh, a group of students from a history class uh, at Duke University who were studying the Berlin Wall. Uh, so they, you know, they pulled my photographs from the archive. They looked at them and discussions about them. And then we had a Zoom call. 
So I think uh, doing community work, your, your main purpose is always to, uh, to actually engage the community on many different levels. Um, and uh, are you pointing to your daughter? <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's, it was to engage the community on many different levels and um, uh, rather than actually, you know, f for other purposes. As, I, mean, I, I could repeat myself, but I won't. Does that give you, does that answer? Yeah. Um, yes, I guess that what, um, uh, and maybe because we, we kind of got lost in translation here, um, you know, yes, it's, it's, it's about why you do the work that you do. And in my particular case is to actually, um, you know, because a lot of the work that I do is kind of has a botanical component to it. So it is a way for like, you know, immigrants or new people that come to Canada, particularly, um, they use the, the garden or the concept of the garden studio and a, as a way to connect to this land and as a way of connect uh, to community. Because when I came to Canada, that's exactly what ground me. Um, so in terms of like my motives, well, my motives is to sort of like give that gift that I had when I moved here. Um, and it was not about like my work being shown. I guess my, my, my concern or my, not my concern, but like my observation is that, um, you know, the people that I work with, you know, like immigrants or, you know, lots of them, they're, you know, they're women. Um, their work is not necessarily, you know, I don't see that, that work put in a gallery setting very often. I mean, sometimes you do, you know, you, you were right, you, you nurture those conversations with certain groups and certain curators, but I find it very interesting that it's very kind of almost niche, right? That that's, uh, you have to look for these particular places for this group of people to be able to show their work or to sort of get that acknowledgement or being seen as opposed to you know we have some other institutions that they're more like you know you know the masters in fine arts kind of type of representation so anyway so it was just more like that well uh, let me say this uh that i i think you uh or each you know each person that is involved in this kind of community work that is involved in a very specific uh, identity uh, and and how you create uh, that community and that identity of that community, the work, the kind of work that you're doing. What I would suggest is to uh, contact organizations that may have similar interests, uh, not necessarily galleries, not necessarily universities or colleges or you know museums, but uh, you know organizations or institutions that may be interested in uh, in engaging in conversations around the work. Uh, and part of that could be either lectures or battle discussions or roundtable discussions or exhibitions. Um, and I think the work will actually begin to grow on its own. I think once you put that work out there uh, and engage it with people that are have similar interests, they're going to be able to actually help you nurture that work and actually grow uh, the visibility of that work. Um, and I, it's, it's all partnering with people, you know, no matter what we do in our careers, it's all about partnering with people and having conversations with people. And I think, I really truly believe that that's the most important thing. Um, so for example, let, uh, let me give you a, a really great example. I had mentioned that when I was doing We Skate Hardcore, first of all, I lived in the community for 15 years. Uh, the project spanned for nine years when I began when I made the last photograph, of it. but my relationships went beyond that. But during that time, I actually taught at this local organization called Musica Against Drugs. Um, and I, I was teaching people who were recovering from drugs and, or uh, be, you know, uh, just got out of prison. Uh, and we were talking about, you know, doing workshops around their lives and how to actually use photography to relay what their lives were about. I eventually had a little exhibition there. You know, it's, they had a little gallery space, but it was for the community. You know, my interest was not getting a show at MoMA. It was not getting a show, you know, at a big gallery and had my prints sold for $3,000. But it was really about sharing my work with the community. Um, and I think once you start doing that, 
the work becomes recognized on its own. The work begins just like a child, you know, the work begins to have a life of its own. So fantastic, thank you. Uh, so um, I wanna begin wrapping up, uh, but I also want to throw out a little bit of a provocation uh, to everyone, not to Vince actually, but to us as a group to think about uh, what it would look like to have a Calgary community photography project. And there are lots of models for ways in which uh, community projects and group projects within communities are done. Um, Vince, I think I remember correctly, and uh, you may or may not be able to back me up on this, but uh, Blue Sky Gallery in Portland uh, was doing the Portland Grid Project for years. And what they did was to actually assign, they just carved up the city map and assigned different places within the city to different photographers who were part of this project. And they just did their own explorations and they were very eclectic, but they brought them together uh, under one umbrella, the Portland Grid Project at the end. So that's a different kind of model of a community engaged uh, and community based project. But one of the reasons that we invited Vince to join us is just to you know, sort of provoke that uh, possible response. What would it look like if this group or a subgroup uh, said, well, we wanna do something about Calgary um, and what would it take uh, to put that together and also what would that look like and certainly the expertise uh, in the little boxes that I see on my screen uh, is here. Um, it's just um, a question of whether or not um, interest, motivation, a rationale and that's a, an important part as well, a rationale for well, why would we want to do that? What would we accomplish by doing it? But I just want to sow that seed uh, to think about Rocio and her botanical work. I want to sow that seed uh, as um, just a, a kind of little enablement in the sense that, you know, there's a, a lot of times when you think, well, I can't do this because nobody would look at it or nobody would care or whatever. Well, you know, you can do what you can like pull up your bootstraps. Well, that's not bootstraps, is it? Your suspenders. Uh, and go out and do. So, um, you know, there's a lot of power in this group to do stuff. And waiting around for someone to hand you the opportunity, you could wait a lifetime, you know? So, um, can I actually respond to that? Because yeah. I, we, had, we had talked about this before we, we went online. Um, but that's uh, that actually is a really um, great question to ask and a, a great question to propose to those of you uh, who are listening to this uh, this lecture. But what I would say is, um, you know, when I started the Newberg Community Photo Project, it really was this kind of passion that came from from within that that I actually could tap into my entire life. You know, there were so many different reasons why I wanted to do this. Um, and uh, I, I will say that the most important thing to do is to identify what the real needs of the community are. Mm -hmm. If in fact you want it to be a community project uh, and maybe not everybody that are on, that are on the Zoom call uh, might have that same interest. If there are other interests, I would say not to try to uh, bring everybody's interest into it, but to really have uh, the community speak to you in terms of what the need might be. And then the second thing is to really engage the community other than this community that is formed here, which I think is really amazing, uh, but to engage your own, you know, the community out in Calgary to, uh, to actually help with it, you know, to, to bring them on board um, and to actually help them define what the needs are. There are two great models that I looked at when I was opening when I was planning the New York Community Photo Project. One was Artists for Humanity in Boston. And it was started about 25, 30 years ago by a young woman who 
who actually took a studio in uh, the Dorchester region. I think it was the Dorchester region of Boston, very, you know, rough neighborhood. Um, and there were these, you know, these guys that used to hang out in front of her building. It was, uh, you know, dilapidated building, a commercial building. And she took a studio there. And she started inviting them up and started to show them different things that she was doing. And they started utilizing things. And she actually started teaching them to do stuff. And now it is one of the most important organizations and not-for-profits in the United States that actually train young people in all the arts, video, uh, graphic design, computer design, photography, et cetera, et cetera. And they actually, uh, painting as well, uh, but they also get them freelance jobs with industries across the city to do art related work, whether it's photography or graphic design. So they get paid. They're actually learning skills to get paid. And that was one of the basis of why we, you know, why we pay stipends to, to kids and why we employ them for other projects that we collaborate on with, with the community. The other one was the Rebuild Foundation in Chicago uh, run by Fiesta Gates. And one of the major components of this organization is that they take recycled materials, wood, everything, and they actually build with these recycled materials, little community centers or art centers or senior citizen centers in these poor areas and primarily black areas in Chicago, in South Chicago and West Chicago. So they were actually making a, 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 you know, an edifice a physical space, um, which Milan Kundera actually talks about all of our understanding of who we are is resides in the buildings that we build and the books that we write and all of that. You know, that's where our identity as a country, as a nation comes in. So they understand that concept and they build these little community centers that are fueled by the community members in terms of what their needs are. So that is really, really important. You know, what are the needs of the community as well as your needs? Yeah. Well, Vince, uh, I want to thank you so much for being with us. Uh, and I know that Bethany uh, has a few uh, pieces of information to share. Uh, so, Beth? Hello. I just wanted to say thank you, Vincent, for a really uh, thought-provoking talk. I've just got many things sort of like running through my mind at the minute, uh, too, about different sort of questions of how to approach different projects and uh, look into the needs of, you know, what, who you're photographing and how you can best represent them and also show that work um, in order to... Um, basically facilitate the need of that community, whether it's social, you know, whether your project is social activism, should it be in a gallery? Otherwise it's just preaching to the already converted. Or so I, I found your project with uh, JR really interesting because obviously that's, that's taking something that's very sort of like activism wise and, and uh, showing it on a very large scale. And then also in, in, um, in your other works, it's a, diff a different sort of style of uh, promoting that work. Um, it's more about the community and more shown at home. So I just, I just thought that was really interesting, those different ways of, you know, what to do post projects and how to uh, show that work in different ways. So that's just, I just wanted to sort of share my comments on that. So thank you very much for sharing that with us, Vincent, and, and thank you for um, participating in this programme. Um, other than that, I just wanted to say thank you everybody for your interesting questions. Um, I will share the NCPP Instagram uh, with you all via email so you can um, keep in touch with what Vincent's projects uh, updates and everything. Um, so we'll see you again on for session seven uh, with Marianne, the director of the Magenta Foundation this Sunday. Uh, this will be an in-discussion event, so uh, please come with plenty of uh, questions uh, on topics such as gaining exhibition and publication opportunities, how to put together a well-edited uh, portfolio, and also guidance on organising pop-up exhibitions. Um, so yeah, come with lots of questions because she's very, very helpful uh, in those fields. And yeah, huge thank you to everybody again for a lovely uh, Thursday evening.
So uh, can I just say one last thing? Um, I noticed that people are using chat and, and thanking. I want to thank everyone uh, for your very considered questions. And if there are any questions that were not uh, posed, or were not able to be posed during this uh, discussion, I'm very happy for you to share not only the Instagram page, but for you to share uh, the NCPP email. Um, and I would be very happy to engage in uh, you know conversations outside of this, um, just like my projects. I always like things to move uh, beyond what the uh, presentation is, but I'd be very happy to, to talk with uh, any of you, um, you know, on, uh, you know, if you want to have a discussion, a more in-depth discussion about organizing something, or if you want to have a discussion about your own work, um, I'd be very willing. I, I want to thank everyone uh, for coming. Um, and I look forward to actually hearing the uh, recording on this. And maybe, <laughs> maybe I can read all the comments on the chat then. Yeah, we'll have those preserved. Great. And thank you, Donna, and thank you, Beth. It's, it's been a pleasure. Likewise. All right, everyone, uh, take care. We will see you Sunday morning. Uh, get your brunch in early um, and um, come prepared with loads of questions because Marianne is a great resource and that's why she's coming along. So take care. Thanks, Vince. Thank you.